Welcome to the Rocky Mountain AI Interest Group's YouTube channel. Our September meeting was entitled AI and Robotics. Presentations were made by Jacob Korniak and Morgan Bell from Furhat Robotics and Harold Biggie from CU Boulder. This is the full presentation and lasts about 1 hour and 57 minutes. See our YouTube channel for shorter presentations of just the main speakers. For more information, see our meetup page, our website, and our YouTube channel. Welcome, everyone. So first, let me just say, SCO buffs. Yeah. Anybody go to the game? Anyone lucky enough to go? I was outside the stadium with about a million people that didn't have tickets. Saw the jets fly over, went to the fan zone, but uh, could, couldn't get in. So, uh, but amazing season. I did create an AI graphic of Ralphie meets Coach Prime, but I won't torture you with that tonight. Um, it's great to see all of you. My name is Dan Murray. You've probably gotten like 100 emails from me in the last week. Uh, I help run RMAG, Rocky Mountain AI Interest Group. Um, as I mentioned, we have people joining on Zoom. And so um, if when we do announcements and things like that, the people on Zoom can only hear you if we do the mic. So I'm going to run the mic around for Q&A, for um, you know, announcements, things like that, so that so the folks on Zoom can, uh, can hear everything OK. Um, the meeting's going to be recorded. We'll have it up on YouTube afterwards. Um, and so, so why don't we start? Uh, this is our, our MAG mascot which is called the Friendly Robot. It still needs a name. Uh, we haven't named it yet. Thanks to uh, Ken Frickless who designed it. The first version he sent me was, let's see, I need to advance to the next slide. Let's arrow down. Okay, it is not, it's just making a noise. So. I might not be in the right. There we go, there we go, okay. So, so this was the first version that, that, uh, that Ken sent me and it didn't seem so friendly, right? I, I, nicknamed, I nicknamed this one Oppenheimer. Um, and there's sort of like a fiery explosion in the background. I said, all right, Ken, we got to have a friendlier robot. Like, like we can't go with this one. Um, so we did the friendly robot. The only weird thing is it looks like it's smoking. It's like, what's that smoke coming out of snow? Uh, you know, typical AI stuff, right? You can't really predict it. Um, let me give a thank you to the board members. Richard Gann, where's Richard? He's right here, he's my co-founder. Um, then we have uh, four CU students. Grace, Anna, Sean, May, please raise your hand, you guys. Thank you for all your help. We really appreciate it. Um, they do things like set up speakers. They talk to professors. They book the room here that we're in. So uh, please join me in thanking all of the volunteers. Okay, I also want to thank uh, many of our supporters. John Backus and Mark Gross help uh, support the group. They help us get this beautiful space. University of Colorado and the Roser Atlas Center, you know, graciously let us use this beautiful room. Chris Byrne has been helping us. Um, or Ken Frickless, as I mentioned, did the logos or the uh, uh, mascots. He can't be here tonight. Um, Chris Byrne, Chris, raise your hand. Uh, thank you, Chris, for all your help booking speakers. And then you're gonna meet Laura, Chris, and Eliza in a second. They each run the, uh, uh, the RMAG subgroups. So uh, please join me in thanking our supporters. Okay, we have free pizza. Thanks to our pizza sponsor, Carlos Garcia. Um, I'm gonna have, thank you, Carlos. I'm gonna have Carlos come up for a minute and just introduce himself. And then if you wanna chat with him afterwards, you'll know who he is. Uh, so let me just give him testing. Okay. So my name is Carlos and uh, I retired 90 days ago. And uh, 
I, I, so, I sold my business. And the long and the short of it is I am not someone that I'm not a serial entrepreneur. I had one company for 29 years and then I stayed on and ran it for seven years after I uh, sold it. But I'm, I'm a one trick pony. I know how, I only know how to do one thing, which is how to sell to the government. I'm a government contractor and a defense contractor. But uh, my average sales size, I've never done, I've never had a year that my average sales size was below $100 million. <laughs> And I've been part of over $100 billion of joint ventures in the past 37 years, 100% of it to the government. The reason I'm here, what I'm going to do with the rest of my life is help people, whether I invest, whether I go on the boards, uh, whether I make any money, even if I help you for free, I'm going to help people sell to the government. So if, if that's of use to you, just kind of raise your hands. Is there anybody here that wants to sell to the government average sales $100 million? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Well, I'm, I'm your guy. Okay, I'll help you. I'll introduce you to my whole network, and uh, there's a I'd probably double or triple your profits, and you don't have to pay me a thing. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Upcoming meetings in October. We're going to have the ethics of AI. We booked two speakers for that. Uh, November is going to be legal issues in AI. We have one speaker and a couple sort of on deck. Thanks to Chris Byrne for his help there. And then December 11th, it's going to be, we're sort of working on it. We have two potential speakers. It's going to be kind of surviving in an AI paced world. Like how do we all sort of adapt and adjust and change what we're doing with this massive number of tools that's coming online. Like, I don't know how anyone stays up with it. And so we're gonna have some speakers kind of talking to, to, uh, to those kinds of things. Okay, let's do the subgroups. Uh, Chris leads the legal AI subgroup. Laura does the marketing uh, subgroup and Eliza does the product one. Uh, subgroups are smaller groupings of people that are passionate about a specific topic in the AI space. And they wanna go deeper than we can go in these monthly meetings. So we're gonna, we're gonna introduce each of our leaders and then we're gonna have a QR code where you can get more information about those subgroups if you're interested. I'll tell you, these guys are really passionate. Um, last, last week I turned to my wife and I said, I think the subgroup leaders are into AI even more than I am. You know, and I'm sure she was thinking like, no, that's impossible. Um, but but no, they're they're super into it, and it's been great to have their their help and involvement. Um, by the way, hello to my wife if she's on Zoom. Okay, so first, Chris Brown, I'll give you the mic here. All right, thank you so much, uh, Chris Brown. Uh, I'm an attorney, hence legal AI. Uh, I believe AI is going to fundamentally change the legal industry, which is why I created this subgroup. Uh, we meet once a month to talk about copyrights, privacy, just issues in AI, and also to explore use cases for lawyers. Um, our next meeting is September 28th. And if you want information about that, scan this code here. It'll take you to our link tree. And tomorrow morning, we are emailing uh, out the details about our September 28th program. So if you go there, you can type in your email, and we'll send you that information tomorrow. Also on that link is uh, our LinkedIn group. We've got over 100 members on the LinkedIn group sharing content, news, and information about legal AI topics. Um, and I would just encourage you, even if you're not a lawyer, join us. I think I might be the only practicing lawyer in the group. I'm the only weirdo, I guess, like everybody else in there is just like normal. So uh, join us, though, because it's super fun to have pe people with diverse backgrounds in there and not just a bunch of lawyers. Um, I think that's all I've got. I'll stick around for a few minutes after uh, the robots and stuff tonight to talk. Uh, you can also shoot me an email if you have questions. Email us chris at pixellaw.com. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Chris. Um, appreciate, appreciate everything you do for the group. Um, okay, next, just in time, Laura just walked in the room. Laura does the marketing group, and I'll have her do a quick intro. Awesome. Thanks. Hi. Sorry to be late. What I miss? All the good jokes. Um, so AI and marketing, we have met twice. We have a great group of folks who gather. Um, we cover topics um, that that we've actually we've actually gone beyond marketing and talk about um, job loss. But the focus is intended to be marketing, and we're going to be doing a lot more show and tell going forward. And um, so we, we're, I'm 
excited for others to join us and learn about different tools that you can use in, you know, whether you're um, creating an email newsletter campaign, doing SEO, um, or uh, maybe a social campaign. Anyway, um, join us there or email me, laurarich5 at gmail. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Laura. If you didn't get any of these, email me and I'll, I'll put you in touch with the, with the subgroups. Okay. Number three, last but not least, Aliza, she runs the, the product group. Yeah, definitely. Hi, I'm Aliza. Um, I currently work at Workday. I'm a product manager, um, but this group is for folks who are interested in product development. So I know product can mean a lot of things. Um, we're really focused in software products right now. So this is intended to be really hands-on. So we've actually, we kicked off last week and met on Thursday and we've got another meetup this Thursday. So last week we talked about fine tuning and had a founder, uh, Mark, come in and talk about his product. And so the idea is we demo and then kind of have a round table discussion. So don't feel like you have to be an expert in whatever the topic is, but we're kind of unpacking topics in a greater depth, I would say. So Thursday mornings, if you follow that link, the events are in there and you can uh, find our Slack group as well. It's actually for all of our mag, um, but there's a lot of discussion and stuff happening in there um, as well. So feel free, I'll hang out as well after if you want to chat about anything. Cool, Thanks. thank you, Lisa. really appreciate it. Um, who's going to run the next subgroup? It, it, it might be you, right? We're, we're, topics are wide open. Like there could be a coder subgroup. There could be a finance one. Uh, AI book club. Someone brought up like, what if we do an AI book club? Uh, so if you're interested, shoot me an email. We'll, 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 talk, we'll talk about it and we'll figure out how to, how to go forward if, you, if you're interested in, uh, in running a subgroup. Okay. I'm gonna now uh, open the floor up to announcements. So if you have announcements related to job openings, events, conferences, whatever, and uh, I will start, so think if you have any announcements, I will start with Trevor, who's gonna talk about the AI Peaks Conference, and then I'm gonna open it up and walk the mic around if you have an announcement. So here you go, Trevor. Fantastic, thank you so much, Dan. Nice to see you all again. My name is Trevor Uptain. Uh, my background is as an engineer at Google Core ML. I moved out here to start a startup. Uh, it's called Hyper AI. But uh, I'm coming here to uh, you today as the founder of AI Peaks. So me and a couple friends were looking for an AI conference in the area, and we couldn't find one. So uh, we decided to start one. And yeah, we'd love to have you all there. We have some uh, great workshops. Uh, going on for everyone from uh, uh, folks in the community. Laura will be giving a talk on marketing and AI. Uh, for the more technical folks, we have a technical uh, track where you'll go from zero to pipeline in Kubernetes and actually spin up your own uh, machine learning systems. So yeah, I'd like to welcome you all out. It's October 14th at Founder Central here in Boulder. Uh, the website is aipeaks.org. And the tickets are going pretty fast. We're capping the attendance at 200, and I think we're up to maybe 120, 130. So uh, make sure to jump in there and get your ticket. Uh, it's an absolutely free event, free lunch, uh, and the speakers and workshops all day. Hope to see you there. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Trevor. That, that's awesome. Appreciate it. Okay, so let me open it up. Uh, does anyone have any other announcements they'd like to make? Chris? So in addition to the subgroup, CU Law in Silicon Flatirons is having a copyright and AI symposium on October 6th, which is going to be really awesome. I know a bunch of the people in our group are going to be there. And my eight-year-old who's watching at home says she wants to join the book club. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Uh, by the way, when you make an announcement, if you want me to send it out to the full list, which is about 850 people now, just email it to me and, and I'll, I'll group those together and send out to our full membership. Okay, other announcements? Was there one over here? You can stay right there. All right, sounds good. Yeah, so my name is Kevin Weller. I work for, uh, uh, I'm a solutions architect for a company called Brewer Digital in Denver. Uh, we do work remotely, but I am looking for someone as a, can come on as a subcontractor to help us with uh, one of our clients who are looking to build a, a automated uh, cabling solution for utility grade solar. So if anyone's interested, uh, Come talk to me. Cool. Thank you, sir. Other announcements? One over here. 
Roger. Hi, I don't know if maybe everybody already knows about these two, but there's two other local uh, AI related groups that I'm involved in. One is the Boulder AI paper reading group. And every other week we go through generally fairly technical papers on um, sort of have several month blocks of sort of topic areas. We've been doing like language, large language models for a while, but uh, this, this group's been going for a couple of years now. Um, and usually pretty good discussions. In fact, a couple months ago, we joined up with a Silicon Valley uh, AI group. And so now it's like three times as many people as you used to have. <laughs> as you can imagine, there's a lot of them out there. And uh, so we sort of combined forces for doing these groups. And um, the other group is uh, down, it's uh, sort of based down in Denver. It's, it's a meetup group that does hybrid meetings also. It's called the AI Salon, it used to be the AI Artist Salon. And they're more focused on creative, uh, on generative tools and that sort of thing. But th the focus is getting broader and broader over time. Uh, that group is on fire. It is growing really fast. Uh, we have lots of people show up to the meetings. It's getting a lot of press attention and things. It's uh, uh, a guy named Kyle Shannon is uh, who started it, and I think he's actually going to be at this yes, Peaks, AI talking Peaks. at the AI Peaks speaking there, conference. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's it's a really interesting group, and they they do have in person meetings down at the Catalyst uh, building down in Denver, which are in they have fun after events and stuff like that. So that's an interesting group to check out if you're at all interested in the creative artistic side of things, including a lot of marketing stuff too. Cool. Thank you, Roger. Yes, that is an awesome group. Uh, anyone else? Maybe one or two more, and then we'll move on. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Carolyn Ujic. I am the director of AI services at Google Cloud, and I am hiring for AI engineers, AI consultants, generative AI specialists. So I'll send you an email. <laughs> but um, if anyone has uh, skill sets in those areas, very interested in talking to you, and you can also reach me at cu at google.com. Nice. Thank you so much. I'll give you yeah, my card. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Last call announcements? Okay, cool. Thank you guys. And again, if you want your announcement um, posted to the whole list, just send me an email. Okay, so now is when I usually ask questions of you guys just to help the speakers uh, sort of understand who's in the room a little bit. Um, okay, so how many people, this is your first RMAG meeting, first, first one. Okay, how many people have been to a meeting before? It's the rest of the people. Okay, how many people just happen to be walking by the building and smell pizza? All right, uh, how many work in the AI field? Wow, that's a lot. Uh, how many are in academia, education? Okay, industry? Anyone from government? Nonprofit? And how many people actually stayed home tonight and just send an AI robot in their place. <laughs> All right, how many people are coders or software engineers? Wow, that's a lot. Uh, how many are working on a product that interfaces with or incorporates large language models? Wow, fantastic. Uh, any entrepreneurs in the room? Nice, entrepreneurs doing AI related startups. Great. Is anyone working in the robotics field? Okay, awesome. Uh, how many people own at least one robot themselves? And I'm not gonna ask for any details. Um, how many own more than one robot? Wow, that's cool. Uh, how many people have used ChatGPT? That's everybody, right? Uh, how many subscribe to ChatGPT Plus, which is the $20 a month paid service, highly recommended? although some other ones are coming online that might be just as good. Uh, how many have used ChatGPT's advanced data analysis, which was formerly called Code Interpreter? That's a very cool tool. How many have used ChatGPT plugins? Wow, that's a lot. Uh, how many use ChatGPT at least every week? Most of the people here, several times a week. Anyone use it every day? Is anyone using it right now instead of listening to this meeting? <laughs> Okay, uh, other tools, uh, who's using Google Bard? Okay, our Google person in the back is smiling. She's very happy to see all those hands go up. Um, Bing Chat, all right. Uh, how about uh, Pi, 
Pi.ai, that's kind of this new one that's really cool. Uh, Anthropic Claude, okay. Uh, Jasper, other, other chat bots, perplexity, cool. How many are using AI for programming help? Writing code, that's quite a few. How many are programming LLMs themselves? Okay, a couple. Um, are any people using other browser add-ons related to AI? There's a, there's a number of those out there. Okay, not too many. Um, how many people have made an AI generated image themselves? That's most of the people. Uh, anyone using Midjourney to do that? Okay, what about Dolly 2? Dream by Wombo, my personal favorite, just a couple people. Uh, Stable Diffusion. What about other uh, AI image tools? Ideogram. Cool. How many people have made an AI generated video? Okay, just a few. Those are just coming online. How many people are trying to figure out where they fit into the new AI world? That's probably everybody here, right? Certainly me. Um, how many people have seen an autonomous robot in the wild? Uh, probably depend, depends on how you define it, right? Is it, is it a self-driving car? You know, is, Waymo, is that an autonomous robot in the field? It probably is. The first one I ever saw was uh, this year. It was at Denver International Airport, and it was at one of the airline clubs. And there was a robot that sort of has a plastic bin on it, and it's kind of tooling around collecting dirty plates and glasses. Now it's not picking them up. It just comes up to you, tries not to crash into you. And you put your dirty plates. And then when it notices that it's heavy, it goes over into the kitchen and waits. And then they give it a new bin and it comes by. But it's just like tooling around, like avoiding people. I, I thought that was, that was very cool. Okay, so tonight's meeting, we are gonna move from electrons to atoms. You know, we've spent a lot of time talking about these cool AI tools, right? These digital tools, how they're being used. Tonight, we're shifting to AI tools in the real physical world with robotics. So our first speaker, our first speakers are from Fur Hat Robotics. Uh, Jacob and Morgan are, are joining us. Uh, Jacob's an AI enthusiast with a passion for emerging tech. He has a background in software sales, and he currently works as a business development representative uh, and university research liaison for Fur Hat and Misty Robotics. When not at work, Jacob enjoys backcountry skiing and climbing in the flat irons. And Jacob and I are gonna lead an AI ski day up at Brainerd Lake this winter if anyone's into backcountry or cross-country skiing. Uh, Morgan Bell is a technology veteran. He's the head of engineering at Fur Hat. Uh, he has over 20 years of industry experience spanning everything from IoT and robotics to desktop software and enterprise SaaS. He leads the engineering and product teams at Fur Hat and previously led the engineering team at Misty Robotics. When he's not working on product strategy or coding, he spends his time with his wife and three kids gaming or enjoying the outdoors. So please join me in welcoming Jacob and Morgan. Hello. Thank you, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Jacob Korniak with Ferrat Robotics. Uh, it's really nice to see everybody today. Uh, I was here a few months ago, it feels like now. Um, and so much has changed, right, in the past few months. So really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining. Okay, so when we think about the robotic revolution, um, I think most of us maybe would have thought it would have been happening by now, right? Uh, Self-aware robots becoming our overlords, making us work in the tungsten mines, right? That, that's what I think when I think of uh, the robotic revolution. And the reality is, is obviously that hasn't happened yet. We're still all here in person, I believe, uh, watching and, and, and learning about robotics and AI. So it hasn't happened yet. But the reality is, is that the robot revolution is already happening and it's been happening for decades. Uh, but maybe a little less bloody and dramatic as we may think. Um, for a long time, we've thought uh, about where these robots fit into our society, what their role is, uh, how they're portrayed in media, what they do, what are the ethics of them, what are the limitations, what are the strengths? And I think so many times we think about how robots are applied today. You know, your car was made by a robot. All the electronics in your hands were made by robots. Um, most of our modern technologies and convenience today 
are thanks to robots. But the reality is that engineers uh, face the same problems today as they did 50 years ago when we think about these robotic systems. I think when I when I was thinking about this meeting today, you know, again, as as Dan mentioned, we're really high level on on really what we think um, on, on the AI side. So I wanted to take a step back and say, you know, what is a robot? Um, and so at a high level, a robot is a machine that is designed to accomplish a task. But you might be thinking now, Jacob, that's great, but is my calculator a robot? And the, and the reality is what robots really are in our society are machines that use their programming to make decisions. If there is a coin uh, that falls on the ground, right, and I would like to pick up this coin, I need to go through three major and high-level uh, processes to pick up this coin. The first, my eyes need to see the coin that's on the ground uh, and communicate sensory issues up to my brain, where the coin is sitting, how it's reflected in the light, how, how, what the depth of that coin is, how it's sitting. Is it, is it, is it up flat? Is it, is it down on its side? Next, I need to send that sensory information to my brain, and my brain needs to make a decision, the decision to, I need to go pick up this coin. Finally, my brain uses that decision, uses the sensory information, comes down, uh, and sends the signals to my muscles to pick up the coin. Now, this may seem like a very simple process to us humans, but the reality is there's so much going on uh, when we think about robotics. The robots need to have sensors. They need to understand where, what, what, what are we talking about? What are the data of this, of this, of this coin on the ground? What am I looking at? How, again, how is it sitting? What are the edges like? It needs to have control systems uh, to make these decisions, to process, process all of those sensory data and make those decisions. And finally, it needs to have end, of, end effectors, um, things that actually go and pick up the coin. And, and as you may, may imagine, there's so much that can go wrong with that, um, whether that's on the sensor side the control system side or the end effector side. Um, today, when I was driving here and getting changed for this event, I looked out, it was 60 degrees and cloudy. Uh, so I put on a sweater and, and nice comfy clothes. And all of a sudden here I am walking uh, into the Atlas Institute sweating, right? And so my control systems made a decision uh, based on my past experience of what 60 degrees and cloudy feels like. Uh, but the reality is, is you're not always right. And that's the problem with robotics. Uh, that again, the engineers are still facing those problems today. Now, when we think about the history of robotics, um, industry is really where robot systems were born. Picking up and moving he medi, uh, really heavy metal objects um, is, is what they're kind of good at, right? So the first major robot uh, and what's considered the first one was uh, the Unimate robot, which is a, a GM production line welding robot uh, that was put into place in New Jersey in 1961. Super basic. Um, it weighed, I think, two tons. It was massive. Um, it made very, very small and calculated, um, um, you know, to welding, um, wel welding interactions. And, and, and now today we fast forward all sorts of uh, systems later and, and they're making our cars. And obviously a lot happened in between here. Um, but, but these robots are in the world today. They're making our cars, they're making our electronics. They're using all those three sensories data and all those control systems to, to do these tasks. The next set of robotics we think about um, are humanoid robots or social robots. Robots that are designed to look and act like humans or and or robots that are designed to interact with humans on a social scale. So the first one we think about here is the Wabot robot, which is uh, created at a Japanese re uh, University Research Institute in 1973. Um, it was extremely advanced at the time. Uh, maybe today we wouldn't think so, but at the time it was a big breakthrough. It could take a whole step every about 60 seconds. Uh, it could pick up uh, very, very small soda cans. It had to be programmed to a high degree. Um, it could do a lot, but what we learned from the Wabot robot is that it could do a lot, but not very well. Um, it could do everything, but it had to be programmed. It was extremely manual. Move forward to the Kismet robot, which is at MIT in 1990. That was really considered the first social robot. Um, and we kind of used, we kind of thought what we learned from the humanoid side of saying, hey, let's just, instead of having one humanoid robot that kind of does everything okay, how about we have one robot that's focused on one area? And that's where social robotics came from, or robots that are designed on the conversational speed, uh, side. So the Kismet robot uh, could talk, uh, it could lip sync very barbarically, um, it could blink, it could express some level of emotion uh, with, its, with its eyebrows. From there, we fast forward um, on the humanoid side over to something like the Atlas robot uh, with Boston Dynamics, which maybe you've seen do the flips and cartwheels. 
uh, or even uh, Sophia, the robot, uh, which is more on the humanoid uh, social robotic side. But the reality is, is that where are these robots, right? We're all in a room today. We've made these big advances over the last couple of years. And I think so many people for so long were thinking about the future, right? This is a, this is a French ad uh, asking people what they thought the year 2000 would be like in 1895. And so this is what they thought the year 2000 would be like. Robots in our everyday life doing tasks and accomplishing things for us. But that really begs the question, where are these robots? Now, I think we know three things. The first thing is that hardware is hard. Humans at a high level, um, we, are, we, we kind of understand how to interact with each other, but we don't fully get that all the way. Um, hardware, it, it's hard to create. It can break easily. Um, and, and if you think about what that last, that last slide showed you was on the actual, um, on the actual uh, prediction of, of technology, we don't have those hardware things uh, actually affecting our lives. We're very far, we're, we're kind of far away from having a robot butler in your house do your dishes. We're far away from that. But we have a language model that can answer all these amazing things. And so the first thing we know is hardware is hard. The second thing we know is that design interaction is a problem, an opportunity that we have not fully solved yet. We haven't fully decided what these robots should look like. We haven't fully decided on on how they should interact. And more importantly, the interaction piece is extremely manual. To have a robot actually speak to you is really, really hard. And the third thing is adoption and affordability. Um, just like here today, nobody owns a, ro a social robot for their common use uh, because they're extremely expensive. They're not practical on, on, on a large scale. And, and, and adoption is a key piece of that. Now to start off with the, on the hardware side, as I mentioned, we really kind of had, a, some people had a perception on what this looked like, right? So if you, if you ask people maybe 50 years ago with the dawn of, of AI and the dawn of these, these, these robotic systems, what we thought we would have, you may be thinking, you know, this is what humans would be interacting with in 2023. This is what our lives would look like. But the reality is, is that most people's robotic interaction, if not almost everyone's robotic interaction, if you don't work in the robotic field, is maybe a Roomba, Right. That might be everyone's, if I, I, I typically, I love to ask this at conferences, like what is the first robot you've interacted with every time it's a Roomba? If you don't work in the, in the industry, it's a Roomba, or maybe you know, it's, on, it's on the actual industrial side of things. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as I mentioned, design considerations. Um, you have kind of a scale here. And when you're thinking about what a interaction with a robot should look like. On one end, you have a robot that doesn't look like a human and it's not meant to look like a human. Uh, there was a famous study uh, done in the early 2000s where Honda was creating a humanoid robot. And when they created a large life-size human robot, when that robot would break um, and have problems, people would be angry at the robot, right? It's, it's oh, this human robot. Come on, you got you to work. You got to answer when I say hello. But what they did is they shrunk that robot and then made it look not like a human at all. And the results were that people, oh, it's cute. It's a little pet. Oh, it's okay if he's learning. Right, so, so we have two sides of the scale here, right? We have the side that's, hey, it doesn't look like a human. It's not meant to look like a human. It's a robot. This is a Misty robot. Uh, she's about a foot and a half foot tall. Um, and on the other end, though, you have robots that maybe try to be human but miss. And I think I can see everyone's eyes here like, oh, man, that's just weird, right? And, and so the answer to this is, you know, what is, what is the middle ground? When, we, when we're thinking about a robot that is in our everyday life, that can inter interact with us in that, you know, that serves this key purpose, what does that robot look like? What you've experienced here today is something that researchers have been studying uh, for a long time. I know researchers studying here at the Atlas Institute are looking at this. Uh, it's called the uncanny valley effect. And so I'm interested for this, if with a show of hands, these set of faces, you know, least human to most human, I'm, I'm just going to have you raise your hands uh, what section you find the most creepy. Okay, so 35 to 40%, do you find that? that group the most creepy. Okay, a few. Uh, so I said 35, 50 to 60%. Okay, a little bit more. 65 to 70%. A little bit more. 80 to 95%. A little bit less. Okay, and then 100% is obviously human. Great. Yeah, yeah, sorry. All right, what was it? Okay. And so, yeah, what you experience here is called the uncanny valley effect, which is a term to describe this relationship between uh, the actual human likeness uh, of this being 
and your affinity towards it, how creepy or likable you find it. And as you see here in, in, in the Uncanny Valley effect, there's a steep drop off, actually, a valley that occurs typically um, between 60 and 80% uh, on average. And so when we're thinking about robotic systems, where do we want to be on this? Uh, what do you want to interact with? If you're interacting with the spot, which I would say is a little bit more on the industrial robot side, it's not really meant, even if spot talked, you wouldn't maybe find it creepy. Maybe some people would. Um, but if it's a little bit too spot, you put a face on spot and maybe had, you know, some sort of mesh uh, interaction face, it might, they might break more into the uncanny valley effect because it's trying to be human. So, so that's kind of something that roboticists think about is, is how do we solve this uncanny valley effect? And, and, and a, something that I don't think we've all decided as an industry, you know, everybody takes obviously different uh, approaches to this problem. The next thing we think about uh, when it comes to the problem with the actual robots in our, not in our lives is adoption. And, and for our robotics, what we like to think about is the next interface. So we, as we move through the years uh, and think about the, the, the interfaces here, we've gone from computers to obviously, to obviously handheld devices, maybe some VR, but what is that next interface? And we believe that next interface is human, uh, or excuse me, is a, is a social robot. And why do we think this? Well, we think this because for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, we've been um, honing this interface. We, we've, we've understood as a, as, a, as a race how to interact with this. You don't need to be taught how to interact with a human. Um, it's innate. You walk up and you do it. And now, obviously, there's some, uh, there's some, there's some problems there, right? If you've ever been on maybe, maybe a bad date uh, or had a hard conversation with a coworker, uh, th there's, it's not always perfect. Uh, but what we do understand is we know how to have this uh, interaction. So why don't we start building interfaces uh, to think about this interaction and incorporate this technology? And so that brings us to Fur Hat today. So here, here's just a quick video uh, of one of our um, use cases here, which is a hospitality-based setting. Let's see if the sound works. Can we turn it to the, thank you. Yeah, I figured we'd turn it off. Might be loud. <laughs> I could. Yep, I think that's what we're gonna have to do. <laughs> uh, just hold this here. Okay. Sorry, y'all. Yeah. Today, I would like to check in, please. Great. I can help you with that. Do you have the confirmation email, the QR code, with you here? Uh, yes, here it is. Thank you so much, Mr. Anderson. Your room is on the seventh floor with a great view of the city. You are now checked in and the app works to unlock your room. I can see that your reservation includes three other people. Are you here with your family? Uh, absolutely. We are here with our kids. Lovely. We are really happy to have all of you stay with us. Uh, thanks. Uh, where are the elevators? No problem. The elevators are just here, to my left. Oh, and can you recommend any good sushi restaurant around here? Yes. I really like a little place called Osaka, which is about a 10-minute walk away. Here is a map. Or would you prefer me to book you a taxi? No, I like to walk. Fantastic. Can I help you with anything else? No, that's it. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day, Mr. Anderson. I am here to help at all times. Goodbye. Goodbye. Great. So while that interaction is amazing and incredible um, and, and super exciting for roboticists around the world, what you just saw uh, was coded, right? That interaction needed to be created uh, and honed by a coding team or engineering team um, that had to be custom tailored uh, to, to multiple situations, whether it's a hotel receptionist or a gate agent, a gate agent um, or any sort of interaction. And if you think about that actually coding piece, how much actual uh, manual you know, time needs to go into that. You need to think about um, what, what these humans are going to respond, how they're going to respond. 
uh, children for a long time have been a very hard piece of robotics, right? You, you put a robot out in a hotel, it's great. And a child walks up and asks what its favorite cloud shape is, right? There's, you can't predict everything that a human may, may say or do. And so it's been a real problem in robotics. And I think it's been one of the hardest pieces for why there's no adoption. Uh, because if you want to put a robot greeting people with the Rocky Mountain Artificial Intelligence Interest Group uh, meeting, uh, pre-language model, you would need to code the entire interaction. Uh, you would need to have every question anyone could answer loaded onto it. It would take a lot of time. Uh, now, which brings us to the, to the AI piece of this, which I know everyone's been, been kind of thinking about, is large language models and why they're important. Um, they've completely revolutionized robotics. Um, if G, some things like GPT, um, API calling into these language models uh, have eliminated the need for coding um, to, to a high level um, and, and, and made the interaction more seamless and endless. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to introduce uh, my coworker, uh, Morgan, uh, who have been a little bit introduced before this. Thanks, Morgan. Easier to this. Yeah, let's go. If I had known that Jacob was a, a good public speaker like this, I would have gone first instead of after him. So uh, we'll make this work the, the best way we can. Um, like Jacob mentioned, the, the large language model thing has actually changed uh, specifically social robotics, which is what we're doing today, uh, in, a, in a pretty profound way. Um, Fur Hat Robotics started as a research project out of KTH University. Um, you can see it here. Um, what we learned at the time really was that we didn't have good tools to do research into social robots, right? No such tool existed. So we had to make those tools. And, uh, and so we did, as a company, we put together a couple of different robots. This was the first, uh, the first Fur Hat. This is Gen 1. Uh, it's beautiful, I know. And then this is the one you see over there, uh, tying into Jacob's sort of hardware is hard thing. Uh, that robot did break on the way here today. So uh, it's, it's cute to look at, I guess, will be the, the mantra here today. Um, but like Jacob mentioned, a lot of what we needed in the, uh, in the scientific domain, specifically doing research, was repeatability, right? So the interactions have to be the same every time. And we put together an SDK that afforded us that, right? You could get the same interaction every single time. Uh, and it's fantastic. The big downside of that and where it gets hard is that the world does not operate that way in, in, in real life. Right? When your dog, when you throw the ball and the dog goes and gets it, the dog doesn't take the same path back every time. The dog goes where the dog wants. The dog brings the ball back. The dog might bring three balls back. Right? You just never know. Um, and so the variation becomes really key to having natural, real world interactions. Uh, and that's sort of where the large language model thing has actually made a big difference for us. Um, in the old days, if you wanted to code an interesting interaction, you went through something like this. You had to think of every corner case. You had to think of every if then else statement, right? You'd go through these giant screen flows um, and it sucks, right? It's a lot of coding. It's a lot of manual work to create that. No one wants to do it, um, but it's necessary to get to an interaction that has some amount of lifelikeness to, right? That's something that's interesting. Um, that became the way we just did it. Um, and you wind up on what's called the content treadmill. And the content treadmill is this dreadful place where you have to churn out new content constantly to keep up with the demand to consume the content. Uh, so we thought, can we approach the problem a little differently? And that's what we did today. Um, you know, we looked at what we do really well at, at Fur Hat Robotics, right? Our thing we do is, is social interaction, right? We know communication. So we know how to speak. We know how to hear. Um, and we know how to pick up some of those social cues. And that's part of what we built into the product. Um, you know, we know about attention, uh, and that one's a little creepy, but the idea here is we're tracking gaze, right? We want to know where a person's looking because it's important in an interaction. And then we know expressivity, right? All of these, you can look at them and, and fairly well understand what each person or what this person is feeling in each, in each frame. So we stepped back and thought, let's, let's just see what we can do to work with these things and focus less on that content piece, or a little less on that flow. So... Uh, we focused on how you sort of describe the meta of the interaction, right? What does that look like? Why does it look like that? And less about designing the content. And what this is going to get into here in a second is just prompt engineering, um, which we're probably all familiar with at this point. Um, it's a big groaner, but we are leveraging chat GPT extensively, right? It's, uh, it does a fantastic job, specifically in terms of latency. Um, there's not a whole lot that's quite as fast as that. So we're using it extensively to try and, and, uh, help generate content, right? When the content was otherwise hard to get. Similarly, you wind up in the same place where you wind up with patterns and templates, the same way you do in programming, right? You find that an adapter pattern or factory pattern become these common tools you go to all the time because they're the way you create standards in the outputs you create. Prompting ends up doing the same thing. If you talk about 
telling the story in the third person as an example. It's a great way to to show how um, to show how content could be created in a repeatable way, but with enough variation to where you don't have to code the whole thing yourself. Um, we're using sentiment analysis pretty extensively as well to try and understand the tone of the message and to understand exactly what the robot needs to understand from the conversation. So when we go through these dialogues with the robot, the idea is there's a, a two-party exchange and we need to understand what the feeling of the user is and what the feeling of the robot is in response to the user. So there's an extensive amount of sentiment analysis that goes on in the back end. Sometimes that's done in, in GPT, sometimes that's done in a statistical model for doing that. It, it depends on the kind of text you're analyzing, but we do it all on text currently. And then we take time to model the things that we're good at, right? So those output variations, those, uh, those emotional classifications, how you deal with attention in the room, those are the places we're spending our time to say, you know, what we're focused on, you know, what output expressivity, what modalities does the robot have, a little less on what content is the robot saying, right? It, doesn't, it isn't about the content itself in the speech. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything is working. Not even close. Right. Well, we've got the variation, the variation we needed, right? We needed the, the, the interactions to come with a, a varied uh, array of outputs. Um, what we still have are things that just don't work, like hallucinations and LLMs are a common problem and they're not really well resolved. If you make a storytelling robot, it's fine. You know, lean into it. Uh, in cases where you need the robot to be a lawyer, uh, it's, it might be a pretty bad lawyer. Uh, the appropriateness of the content, we haven't solved that either, right? The robot can sometimes say things that are just totally inappropriate or wrong. It happens, uh, and we're still dealing with that. And we're not going to invent those guardrails, right? There's, there's people in the industry who are going to do that. Uh, we're really consumers at that level. Um, there's a lot of built-in barriers. You've all heard it say, as a large language model, I don't have an opinion on that, right? Uh, you know, you have to work around some of these kinds of things, and they're built in by the developers on purpose. Um, one of the harder ones for us actually right now is keeping up with the developments. You know, I think Dan mentioned this earlier, things are moving so fast in this industry that I can't even take Falcon off the shelf and, pi and play with it, right? I don't have time. Uh, it's a huge deal, right? There's just no way for us to keep up with all of the developments. There's not enough staff to do it. So as we go through and see how the robot interacts with people and how it, uh, you know, it interacts on speech content, how it creates new unique content in these conversations, um, we're really just not even scratching the surface. There's just not enough people to do all the work. There's not enough time to do all the testing. And that's really where we are today. Um, we're at that moment where we would have showed off the robot and we would have gone through like a fancy demo. Uh, however, the robot didn't, uh, didn't make the trip successfully today. So I think Jacob has a video. Is that right? No, that went away. That's all I had actually then, since the video didn't make it either, the robot didn't make it. Uh, we can probably talk about it after the fact or answer questions. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Morgan. Our next speaker is Harrell Biggie, who's a fourth year PhD student in computer science at University of Colorado Boulder, right here, specializing in robotics. He works in the Autonomous Robotics and Perception Group advised by Professor Christopher Heckman. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in EE from University of Rochester in 2018. And his research is centered on autonomy, perception, natural language integration, and field robotics. Additionally, at CU Boulder, he served as project engineer and led the perception team for CU's entry into the DARPA Subterranean Challenge. The Sub-T Challenge was designed to accelerate the capabilities of autonomous robots in challenging underground search and rescue operations. Harrell helped to lead the team to an impressive third place ranking among renowned universities from around the world. This talk will cover Harrell's contributions to the DARPA Sub-T Challenge and explore his recent work leveraging LLMs such as ChatGPT for enhancing robot navigation through natural language commands. To illustrate these concepts in action, he'll do a live demo uh, with the Boston Dynamics Spot platform. Please join me in welcoming Harrell Biggie. Thank you for the nice introduction. So um, as Dan mentioned, I'm gonna be going over um, foundational models and how we can use them for robot navigation, navigation specifically on that Spot robot we saw that um, we'll bring into the room after this talk. So to get started here, as Dan mentioned, 
I was a part of the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, and here you can see myself and some of our teammates as we prep a test deployment out at Edgar Mine near Idaho Springs. So that challenge was really designed to simulate search and rescue scenarios. So we had two different types of robots we sent out there, the Boston Dynamic Spot, um, and then the ClearPath Husky, which we can kind of see the back of it right there. And it was supervised by a team of humans, but mostly autonomous. Um, so we can kind of see the robot going into the tunnel, and these had to go in by themselves, explore, and look for objects that would indicate human presence. So what exactly do I mean by all this and why are, is this important? So as unfortunately in recent times, there's been numerous articles and tragedies where there's been earthquakes, a lot of collapsed rubble, mine collapses, people are trapped, and it's very, very hard for search and rescue teams to go in there. Um, putting other lives at risk to save another life is what people do on the daily basis, but that comes with inherent risk. And one of the areas that uh, DARPA really wanted to improve is situational awareness. Can we send a robot in to get an idea of what's going on before sending another human in to make sure that it's both safe to go rescue someone um, and to find the people who are in the most immediate need of danger and of uh, rescuing? So how did DARPA structure all this? They created these courses. Um, ranging from urban underground environments, tunnels, um, caves. And there they had this group of people known as the pit crew for us. That was five different people on uh, the team and I. Um, there was our robots that went in that we saw in the other video, uh, modeled by Star Wars robots here. Um, and then there was one human supervisor who will become very important. They could kind of monitor what was going on and override any kind of like high level commands that they could see on the monitor, as you can see here. Um, if there was communications available, that was another key component to this challenge. There's no Starlink underground. So we had to do all of that stuff ourselves, deploy our own Wi-Fi networks and everything as these robots went out. So I just want to highlight a few things at the final event. We, at the top, we see one of the Husky robots I mentioned. Um, there's the full team in the next image over. Um, as you can see, we also were competing against a bunch of universities and ended up taking third place against teams like NASA's JPL um, CMU and a bunch of other world-renowned universities. So this was kind of a huge deal for CU. Thank you. So the rest of this talk, I'll kind of be going over Team Marble. That was our team name at the DARPA challenge. A few of the perception challenges. I was one of the perception leads as well as a project engineer for overall autonomy stack. Um, and then I'm going to go to a little bit of a shift towards language guided navigation, which is the areas I've been more recently working in and kind of more relevant to chat GPT and large language models. Um, so let's get started a little bit with how do we perceive on robots? So that's one of the big things we need a robot to do. It needs to understand its environment so then we can do actions in that environment. So for us, uh, we had this sensor head that we developed for our spots and huskies using a variety of off the cell sensors. So starting with these uh, FLIR or Gigi RGB cameras. So that gives us an idea of what's going on in two dimensions and color in the environment. Um, we had these uh, LIDARs. So there's two LIDARs in front here. Um, PicoFlex flash LIDAR gives you kind of depth, 3D depth information. Uh, the Auster LIDAR does the same. And then we had um, an inertial measurement unit to kind of get an idea of the roll and pitch and yaw of the robot. So what does all that look like in reality? Assuming we have this little spot here, um, it's outside in a courtyard. So those are the views from three cameras, the left, front, and right. But what does that look like um, as a point cloud? So that's what the, some of those three sensors such as the ouster give you up top, those little points. So you can kind of see the trees being demonstrated up there. Um, you get this 360 degree view of the environment and it's pretty dense representation. Uh, so that's what we kind of leverage a lot to do our navigation and planning inside the environments. So why were we sent into the environments? To find objects that would indicate human presence. Uh, these robots were sent in there to look for things like a survivor, um, climbing rope, backpack, anything that could indicate someone had been there and probably needed rescuing. Uh, there was also some localization for things like a cell phone that was using Bluetooth. And then there was a CO2 gas to mimic kind of a gas leak or something like that. Um, so what does our human supervisor see? This is an example of the interface that we used uh, that the guy standing up front of the course using a monitor was looking at. Um, 
we can see that there's individual robot maps on the side. So those are generated off those point clouds that we saw, which is giving you kind of a three-dimensional idea of what these underground environments look like. Uh, we had a merged map in the middle. So we had four robots out in the course at once. So that would aggregate all the maps into one view to give an overall picture of what everything looks like. Uh, and finally, all the objects that were being detected on board autonomously came up as a list and the human supervisor could confirm what they were and what they weren't. Um, and then they had the ability, assuming there was communication, to override anything of the autonomy stack that was not operating correctly. Uh, so let's take a quick jump into what it actually looked like when these robots were underground. So this is an example of one of the spots. Uh, you'll see the purple path. That's the spot running its onboard exploration algorithm. So it's trying to explore for new areas in the environment while avoiding any terrain that it can't go over. And while it's doing that, it's looking for all of those objects I just described. Um, so kind of one thing to keep in mind, that video is at about 5x. So the robots were not moving that fast, but <laughs> it would have been a long video otherwise. So what is, how big were these environments? Well, they were on the scale of a kilometer or so. So here we had our four robots and the path they took at one of the final DARPA competitions. And you can kind of see these were like pretty much mimicked real environments such as a subway station, tried to mimic a New York subway station. Uh, we got a little warehouse here. Um, we have kind of a foggy area. DARPA was kind of really wanted to make it hard. They put fog because it messes with your cameras and everything like that. So we did really well at the challenge, as I mentioned, third place, but there was a lot of things to be improved. At the challenge, the top scoring team only rescued about 50% of the artifacts, which means a lot of room for improvement. You don't want those odds if you're the ones out there needing rescuing. So one of the ways we think we can improve that is jumping into um, using large language models. Uh, that human supervisor interface I mentioned is great if you are getting a PhD in robotics like I am. Uh, but if you're not, using one of these robots would be really difficult with that interface. So. Um, that's why we think that doing something like natural language is far more uh, appropriate for this. So for example, we could tell the robot to go down the hallway until you find the backpack and then turn left. Um, and that command will let it just execute there and do that rather than clicking like a little waypoint here, move the waypoint as it progresses, which is a really slow process. And when time is of the essence, you really want something more efficient. So. We were able to do this leveraging uh, code generation abilities of Chad GPT. So you can see here the robot is looking for something to do a kickflip on. In other words, realize it needs to do a skateboard. Uh, it can do something a little bit more helpful, such as if firefighters were using the robot, they could look for a fire hydrant. Um, we can tell it to go to specific people, like distinguish the persons on the table as opposed to a person who's not. Uh, we can specify the color of an object, uh, look for the white fan and have the robot navigate to there. And this is all being done using ChatGPT as the backend to generate code based on the natural language prompt. So what is one of the key challenges that faces robotics in doing this type of navigation? It's called language grounding. So we have the sentence here, go to the blue bin on the left of the red backpack. And everything in that sentence needs to be associated to either the physical environment or an action on the robot. So for example, we need to associate the word blue bin with that blue bin in the actual image. And red backpack needs to be associated with the red backpack. Now that looks pretty simple if we as humans are doing it, or maybe you could run an object detector and do that. But the big, big challenge comes with the ambiguity in language. Uh, so taking an example like this, go to the chair on your left. Uh, one could think it's leftmost chair, or it could be this chair. But uh, that really depends on what your intent and specification was, which is one of the areas we're actively trying to resolve to make sure robots go where we want them to go. So with that in mind, um, I'll dive a little bit more into a contextual example here. Um, so we have the sentence, go to somewhere where I can watch a movie. And this is the scene. So we want the robot to end up going to a chair or something like that where it can see the movie. So as I mentioned, this is being done using code generation. So this is a code right here is all being generated by ChatGPT. So it's looking for a TV or a screen, and then it's finding all of those. And if it finds nothing, it will, of course, return a pro an error. And then it's looking for anything that relates to a couch, chair, or anything like that. And then we are trying to find the closest one to the TV. 
and that's where we end up sending the robot to. So we have the little video here going. Uh, so it ended up going to that chair. We can't see it in the frame, unfortunately. The videotography was um, not the best while we were running this experiment. But uh, the TV is kind of where those cones are in the background. So I'd like to thank um, all of the collaborators in the DARPA challenge, um, and especially my lab, the Autonomous Robotics and Perception Group, uh, as well as my advisor, Christopher Heckman. Um, and now I think the fun part is going to happen. We're going to actually be showing the spot and doing some of the live demos. Um, and while we're setting that up, I'll show a few more commands from our um, system. So this is, this is an example of multi-agent navigation where we are using language to control both spots. So Dusty, if you want to walk the spot around the room just a little bit so people can get a good view of it. Um, I don't, Dusty wasn't introduced, but Dusty is the lab manager in our group. Um, very nice of him to help out for this. So Dusty, if you want to, yep, perfect. So now I'm going to, on my interface over here, I'm going to tell the robot to go to the fire extinguisher. Um, and this will just take a little bit. It takes about 30 seconds to a minute. That's one of the limitations of these methods. Um, it's a combination of how long it takes to query chat GPT, go over the internet. Then we have to send our images back to a server to process. Um, so this is actually running on a 4090 back in our lab. Um, so. Part of it is also we're using a cell phone hotspot, so it just takes it a little bit of time. <laughs> uh, CU's wireless doesn't play well with our robots for some reason. <laughs> um, so, Dusty, if you want to send the robot, and I, unfortunately, I can't really show this. I can kind of show the screen to people here, but this is kind of what we see on our end with the generated code in the image. Um, so that's kind of what the robot can do. Um, we could try to send it to a few other things, maybe the black cart next to Dusty. So, sorry, it's a little hard to type one-handed. <laughs> So I just sent over the command. Um, uh, go to the black cart. So we're having the robot identify that black cart right now. So right now it's generating a piece of code that's going to have something like find the black, find a cart, verify the cart is black. Um, and then we're going to do a 3D projection. So taking what it found in our 2D cameras, we associate that with that 3D point cloud that we saw earlier on the ouster LiDAR. And then we get a 3D waypoint that we can have the robot follow to. Um, so we do that using what's known as a path planner. Um, so that's kind of running a grid-like search inside the maps that we show, that I showed earlier. Um, so unfortunately, Dusty, you kind of, the black cart in the lighting here did not show up so great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's one of the challenges we do face a lot with uh, specifically these camera models. The auto exposure in some of these lighting conditions is not as great. Yeah, that's why we have, um, I mentioned the five watt LEDs. If, uh, if people in the front want to look away from the robot, Dusty, if you want to just turn them on real quick. Uh, other one? Other side? No. Interesting. Uh, so there are, on the sides here, we do have like really bright LEDs that we try to create our own lighting conditions underground to help with a lot of these issues. Uh, uh, these cameras work really well under constant 
uh, lighting conditions. So, and as um, the previous speaker mentioned, like hardware is really hard. One of the reasons we went with these cameras is we found that USB cameras were just very, very unreliable, uh, especially underground. So the robot would have a lot of shock and vibration and those USB connectors are quite flimsy. So ethernet is, and machine vision grade cameras are far more reliable in that sense. Um, yeah, so you can send it over to that cone. Yeah, and it should uh, figure it out. Yes. Uh, yeah, try to send it again. Try to send it again. <laughs> so as you can see, this is all like research, a little bit work in progress, but uh, no, because we can actually see which one it, it found here. Um, but it sometimes, uh, there's a whole mapping piece that goes along with here that it's generating online. There it goes. Uh, maybe. No, no, I think it's gonna come back around. <laughs> Yeah. So like I said, uh, this is like, this is a uh, early kind of work into associating large language models with robot navigation. Um, so we have plans to improve this obviously going forward, but that's kind of what I have. And if you guys wanna maybe see the robot, we can walk it through the aisles real quick, if there's time for that. So just make sure your feet are kind of away from it. It shouldn't hit you, but. <laughs> uh, I'd say probably around 60 to 70 pounds or so with all of the stuff on it. Yeah. Yeah, it can carry up to 14 kilograms on top, which we have about 11 on there right now. Any other questions about the robot? Ah, that's a good, with an academic Question, discount what does based. It cost? Uh, yeah, question was, what does it cost? With the academic discount, it's about 80,000 for the base alone. And everything from the black part up is, which we put on is probably another 20,000 or so. So $100,000 or so is around the price tag for all of this. Other questions? Here. You, sorry, you got what's the, uh, that's a, the, what's the thing on the side in the red thing? Question, what's the, what's the red thing on the side? So that's a holder to put the hotspot in so it can connect to the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's held on with uh, Velcro. So it's not, it was a, it's kind of an afterthought. It wasn't needed when it was underground. So raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, let's go, Sean. So you mentioned you're using LiDAR, are you using computer vision and LiDAR? And can you kind of talk about the strengths and weaknesses of either or and why'd you made that decision? Yeah, so for object identification, um, doing it for the color channels uh, in computer vision is much, much easier to do. Uh, you can detect it from those point clouds I showed earlier, uh, but it's much more resource intensive to do it in three dimensions and color gives you a really big clue as to what an object is. Uh, the reason we use LiDAR is because, especially in underground environments, it's not susceptible to different lighting conditions. So it works in the dark, it's emitting lasers, and it's giving you those 3D points, which you can use to localize yourself off against, which is really hard to estimate out of a 2D image. So the strength of LiDAR is 3D localization and images is for object identification. Okay, next question. Any plans for applications with fire and rescue for firefighting? Uh, we do have potential work um, in our lab where 
we are looking at m mapping uh, forest fires on one of our projects uh, with the spot. Um, that's work is pretty in the early stages, so I don't have too much more information on it, but I know we're actively looking that into future projects. Okay, one question from the Zoom audience. This is from Ellen. How would you improve the performance of LLM navigation? Use local LLM running on the hardware directly? So that's uh, one option. Uh, specifically, we're looking to running uh, Llama 2. Um, for those of you who are familiar, Llama 2, some of the quantized models will fit on like six to eight gigabytes of VRAM. We have a Jetson Xavier in there, um, and we could upgrade that to something like the Jetson Orin and potentially run a smaller version of Llama to do this. So that's one of the next steps we're looking into. Okay, next question. I'm trying to figure out what is the state of the art for this technology right now. Let me phrase how that I'm trying to figure that out. So I saw what you demonstrated here. And maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. So if I was in some military lab where the budget is much, much higher, how much more of a leap beyond what I saw today would I see? So that's hard for me to answer because I'm not in the military labs, but I would imagine um, I would imagine that one of the things that would be much more advanced is we're right now limited to line of sight with the cameras. Uh, one of the key areas to improve on to do other things is known as semantic mapping, which labs are researching. And I'm sure the military probably has better maps. Semantic maps contain rich information about the environments. So you could label all these objects in them and then potentially have the model reason over those. So then anything it's seen before it could go back to and navigate towards. Um, they probably also have better GPU resources so they can create their own data sets and fine tune some of these large language models. So I would imagine they could probably take it up two or three steps, but um, a lot of this only came out since March with like ChatGPT, so I can't imagine they're that much further along um, in terms of being out ready for production unless they had access to large language models before then. Uh, oh, that's loud. I'm curious how you fuse the two different sensor modalities. So with like the RGB and the LiDAR, are you using the LiDAR? the RGB uh, predictions to mask the point cloud, or are you do doing some modeling with the LiDAR data as well and doing like a mid-layer fusion? So the way we're doing that on here is um, the LiDAR is generating um, what's known as an Octomap. So it's a volumetric map where each kind of point on the point cloud, it might help if I go back to that slide, which. So if you see kind of these uh, point clouds here, when we get to the actual map, every group of points within a 15 centimeter radius is kind of grouped together. Um, and then we know how far offset the camera is from the LiDAR. So we can do a, like a ray projection from there to one of the points on that map. And that's how we associate it to a three different point. But in terms of inside of the machine learning networks, uh, they're treated independently right now. Um, we have one network operating um, to do object detection on vision and then other algorithms running on the LIDAR. Um, can we use the microphone? Yeah, I was... sure. Sorry. Part two of our question. I just wanted to confirm. So then at the end, you're fusing the two predictions together and I'm assuming you do it by some sort of like IOU overlap between um, so the prediction is only in RGB. We're just uh, associating it, associating that, it to the yeah, LiDAR at okay. the last step. That was my question. So you're okay. using it to mask the point cloud to yeah. figure out where in 3D it is. Okay, cool. Thanks. If you understood that question, you're better than me. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, one other question in the in the images that they were going to find in the tunnels, there was something on each one that I think you call the localization point. What, what is that? Yeah, so to, in order to score at the challenge, that localization point was where DARPA took um, like survey grade instruments used in construction. And they said, that's the point you have to tell us where the object is. Mm. But they also told us you have to score it within five meters. So as far as I'm aware, us and most of the other teams just ignored that point. And if we found the object at all, <laughs> we reported wherever we found the object because five meters, Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of space in this kind of room as you go to the scale of a kilometer and you're trying to predict where you are. It's actually 
non-trivial to get the robot to predict where it is within five meters, let alone find something else within five meters. So the gotcha. localization point was kind of not that applicable Good other point. than to the rules. Cool. Thank you. I think you had a question. Last. Can you speak into the mic? How long will this last on a single battery charge? Uh, it'll last about um, 75 to 90 minutes, depending on how much you're using the motors. Okay, and by the way, I'd like to broaden the questions too to both both sets of speakers. If someone has fur hat questions, you know, we'll just do full, full Q&A, but uh, let, sure. let, let's continue, sir. So where time is of the essence and you're integrating these natural language models, uh, what do you think you could get the latency down to in like best case scenario? Um, I would think we could get it down to sub-second responses on queries. Uh, Llama 2, for example, on a 4090 will probably produce uh, similar code to this in right now about 500 milliseconds. So combined with a faster object detector, um, only challenge is Llama 2 requires fine tuning to even approach the performance of GPT right now. Um, okay. It's just not as robust. I don't know if anyone else has played around with it, but GPT kind of outperforms for coding at least. So you'd need the local model in order to, to make that work? The local model or partner with someone with faster API calls, something yeah. like that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Let me do a question from the Zoom audience. This is from Josiah. How would a multimodal network that integrates the robots' senses together improve things? Yeah, so that's one of the things we're actually very curious at exploring. Um, so GPT-4, as many of you are probably aware, is supposedly multimodal, but that hasn't come out yet. Um, so we're very interested in kind of comparing the performance between what we're doing here, which is only giving it the language input and telling it how to operate on a separate network to get the inferences. We assume that would increase performance, but until there's more multimodal networks kind of available, it's difficult to say. Um, the ones I've tested so far, um, one that comes to mind is Mini GPT-4, uh, just haven't really performed that well with the types of sensors that we've seen on our robot. Um, and I guess to, just to finish that off, one of the key challenges for the multimodal networks is the sheer amount of data that you need to do it. These large language models are trained on trillions and trillions of pieces of information. We just don't have those kind of data sets available for robotic sensors right now. Um, do these autonomous robots require continuous broadband connectivity? And if so, how are they going to do remote discoveries and searches? So the natural language-based navigation required that. Everything else, that was not running at the DARPA challenge that happened after. That was one of the reasons, one of the ways we were trying to improve. And at the challenge, it was running mostly autonomous. And then we would deploy um, like little Wi-Fi hotspots to send a local connection back to whoever was monitoring it. But if there was no connection, the onboard autonomy would take over um, and eventually find its way back to connection. So kind of the answer is no, it does not require it. But if you want to supervise, you do need it for the language stuff at this point. OK, let me ask if anyone has a question for the fur hat speakers. And then we'll just swap the mic over. So you have a fur hat question? Okay, so let's start. Why don't you start with with Harrell, and then we'll go to Fur Hat. Thank you. Um, does this, do these robots have any way of memorizing the things that they've seen, so that you can prompt them to go back to things that they've seen? Like, if you say find the backpack and it finds it, and then performs another task, can it return to that object? Um, so that goes back into what I was talking about with semantic mapping earlier, where you're mapping your environment with labels of what's in the environment. Um, so, for example. You could see all like the chairs here, all the people here, and it could keep track of that in the map. Um, that robot right now is not running it on board. One of the limitations there is those types of maps are very GPU heavy, um, and running them on board is quite difficult still with the current available hardware and algorithms out there. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm curious about biometrics with the fur hat. Um, like clearly you have to project it onto the face. So how do you get it accurately so that it can move its mouth and its eyebrows? Uh, yeah, I mean, the projection today, it's it's a back projected face onto a mask. The dimensions are sort of pre-calculated. So we know all of that up front. Um, and then there's a bunch of different dimensions for the face. So <laughs> yeah, it's always creepy when that happens. <laughs> when, when you look at the actual textures, they're this bizarre shape that we have to do to actually get it to work. 
Um, and there's a bunch of shapes that don't work. So the dimensions of the face are actually critical. You can't do like a, a proper dog. We have like a pug mask and it's kind of dog-like, uh, but anything where there's any depth to it, it doesn't work very well. Okay, more fur hat questions. Fur hat. So I was curious, uh, have you had to deal with people that are say lying or like if they're giving a prompt to it, if they're under distress, does the does the fur, fur hat actually recognize and ask a question maybe unrelated to what they're asking? No, not currently. Uh, if, if something sort of semantically about what you're saying conveys the idea of distress, perhaps. Um, but again, lar mar it's largely going through the large language model on the back end and we've done no refinement to it. Um, there's some stuff we've got in a lab that we're working on where it could potentially pick that up from the tone of voice uh, or from the way you're speaking, but we don't have anything else in there that's doing that today, no. Okay, other fur hat questions, Liza? Uh, fur hat or the robot. Um, you guys have talked about autonomy and how do you guys define autonomy and how far have we pushed the robots or the technology for autonomous? Um, would AGI and robots potentially being able to set their own goals or with recursive self-learning where they're able to change their code how far have we pushed it and how far do you think we could go? Um, you're probably more uh, more up to speed with that. On the fur hat side, there's not a lot in the way of autonomy. Uh, the, the conversations themselves are fully autonomous, but it's content, it's not code. It's not generating any code at runtime today. Um, you guys are generating a crap ton of code at runtime. So I suspect you've seen uh, some getaway conditions that are probably pretty cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's really good question, how far it can go. Um, I think that goes back to some of the limitations in the large language models is they don't know what truth is. They don't know um, when they're right or wrong. They also don't execute code right now. So when code's wrong, we sometimes get um, ill-formatted code that we can't execute and we have to handle that. Um, so one of the ways we're, one of the things we're looking into in the future is how to verify some of those outputs. Um, so either through simulation or logic-based formulation. And I think that's gonna be the enabler for more autonomy to enable some of those um, what's right and wrong truth before this can really go into the wild with autonomous operations. When Spot becomes autonomous, just give me 10 or 15 minutes to get out of the room. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, so for Furhat, a question about your a question about multi multi-sensory inputs. It sounds like or it looks like you're you're just using uh, audio to listen to what people are saying and then try to respond to that. But in, in situations where you have a hotel lobby that could be very noisy and distracting and, and you know, the different sounds could be interfering. Have you looked at using different, using multiple kinds of input like video mm -hmm. to look to do some lip reading along with the video to do a better job of understanding what people are actually saying? Yeah, you know, we've tried it a little bit. Uh, again, only in the lab. That stuff is really compute heavy. Um, so it does take quite a lot of energy. Um, we've got voice activity detection that helps to sort to differentiate, you know, where things are coming from. And you can do some uh, mouth movement detection as well to just try and infer where the sound is coming from. Um, more often than not, we try really hard just to shut the sound out. So for us, we, uh, you know, we, we use like shotgun mics and things like that to try and, and suppress as much of the outside noise as we can, because um, otherwise the problem just gets exponentially difficult uh, from a compute perspective. So similar question for the um, for the Marvel team. Have you have you thought of using or have you tried using audio as well? So, you know, especially in an underground rescue situation, listening for sounds, listening for people screaming help or banging something, you know, could be a really interesting thing to incorporate into the LLM help you to incorporate multiple inputs and multiple kinds of sensors to figure out what's going on? So uh, the first part of the question is, we haven't personally explored that, but some of the teams did. Uh, for example, the cell phone was playing like a loud video that you could also localize off of it. Um, that was mostly a constraint on our team with number of members and resources. We had about 12 PhD students. Other teams had um, 30 or 40, so it kind of depends uh, how you want to prioritize your resources. Uh, but I do think it's a great idea. Um, in terms of using it to an LLM, I think you would want to, at least in today's world, you'd probably need to use something like Whisper or another similar API to transcode it first to text, so then feed that into an LLM. I could probably use some of that context to get you some code or something that leads you a little bit more towards what's being said in that statement. 
Great question. Um, let me just talk to the Zoom audience. Uh, continue to type your questions into chat, and then we will read those. Um, we have about a half hour. We'll just keep going with Q&A. So uh, next question. Right into this. Okay. <laughs> so um, I guess this is more a question for the marble side of things. Um, I'm curious about what kind of algorithms you use for pathfinding for the thing, assuming that you know what you're looking for already and it's got there's more or less a target, it's got a variable of obstacles, and it seems like that's applicable to something we're working on. So sure. So we're using um what's known as a graph-based planner, specifically rapidly exploring random trees. So we take samples in the environment and then we try to connect uh, feasible controls between uh, point A and point B. So we take like thousands and thousands of those samples and build up a graph. And then we run um, something like an A star or another graph based search to find the shortest path between what's been sampled on our map. Does that answer the question? Cool, thank you. I'll come over here. Other questions, sir? So my question's for Jacob actually. As somebody in biz dev, who's for had targeting and trying to sell to and what kind of companies are actually buying what you guys are selling? Yeah, great, great question. So um, for has been around for about seven years, eight years now. So um, for a large portion of our business is research. Um, people like the gentleman sitting next to me, right? Doing research on robotics, doing research at uh, university research labs or government research labs or DARPA and government re and, and a variety of different robotics research labs. So that's probably about 60 to 70% of, of who we do, um, who we sell to. The other 30% is uh, on the commercial side. And that piece is expanding like crazy with the with this implementation of LLM. So um, anything where it's a transaction transactional based conversation, right? So um, you know, question and answering, medical screening, um, you know, hotel receptionists, gate uh, airport gate agents, um, even as things where you're simulating things. So whether it's a training robot to simulate an angry customer, or we do a lot with, um, you know, medical, uh, medical uh, patient simulations, right? You can tell the language model to be a specific case of Alzheimer's and have the nurses practice uh, interacting with that, you know, Alzheimer's patient. So um, anything that, again, that has that conversational limitless interaction piece are, are really big for us at the moment. Yeah, the the medical student piece was cool in your uh, in your annual meeting. I heard about the that you know medical students are starting with the fur hat and then moving on to to real life patients. I thought that was very cool. Okay, next question over here. Yeah, you mentioned that um, the fur hat robot can detect um, you know eye can track eye uh, emotions, facial expressions. Um, what are some of the use cases you're working on that are using those sensory inputs to detect these human expressions? Yeah, I mean, more often than not, we, we're really focused on gaze uh, because gaze is one of the key uh, insights into the interaction, right? So if I'm looking directly at you, you know I'm doing that. If you're not, you know, you know I'm distracted and I'm not part of this conversation. Um, on the, let's see, you're 100% right. You're 100% right. Uh, and that's the difficulty of it, right? Is that, uh, especially in conversations, if Jacob and I were staying in front of the robot, talking to each other and the robot at the same time, it falls apart pretty fast, right? Um, so you don't have enough. And uh, a lot of the stuff that we typically think of as emotion recognition doesn't really work that well, right? Most of those aren't, you know, they're categorically wrong in a lot of cases. You get smile more often than not. So smile back is the, the number one thing people want to see. Next question. Uh, two questions. One, uh, when do you, how many years away are we from the Isaac Asimov holy grail of general human interaction with robots where they can understand general context, questions and commands? And secondly, um, uh, Furhat, you merged or acquired Misty. How was the technology, was there any technology transfer or was it more just people hire? What, wh how has that worked out? So two questions. Yeah, on the Asimov side, I don't honestly know, right? Technology is moving at such a fast pace that it's hard to say, right? I, I, if you'd asked me a year ago if I thought we'd be here today, no, I had no idea. Uh, so I don't pretend to be able to read the future. Um, as far as the, the acquisition is concerned, um, there wasn't a lot of merging of technology. To be honest, the platforms are radically different. Um, you, you know, the Fur Hat side is really specific. Um, the Misty side is really specific, and it's hard to marry them together. I spent several months trying to figure out if that was even feasible, and then the answer is no, not, not in any meaningful way. But we all get along really well. Uh, 
Uh, so unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to give a similar response. Um, I would say I think we're still a ways away, but um, as mentioned, like even a year ago, to think we could do this kind of stuff with robotics um, in this kind of general fashion was just not even really conceivable. Uh, there's been research in like language guided navigation now for years, but a lot of earlier models, highly domain specific, you had to train them on your domain. Uh, you said sentences outside of the initial training corpa and then it all fell apart. So I don't know, I think it's gonna take a few more like big developments like LLMs, but uh, I still think we're a few, quite a few years off, but it's hard to predict at this point in time. All right, so I have a question about, um, actually I have a few questions. So in regards to the group that's working with Spot, um, you said that you had two separate uh, internal models that you're working on. I was curious, how many tokens do you have in those models? Um, so what's actually running on the robot right now is uh, the GPT models. So they can go up to 32,000 tokens. Okay. And then Llama, uh, which we're looking at swapping out to, that can go up to, I believe, 8,096 tokens. Okay. And then are you planning on doing anything when, with the constitutional program, like networks? Um, that's something that we are, I've been reading up on and slowly looking into, but no immediate plans right now. Okay. And then, um, let's see, I guess it's a question for everyone who's pr uh, presenting today. I'm curious about the new development with the um, NVIDIA, the tensor core processors. Are y'all planning on applying or implementing any of that kind of te technology into your, your workflow and development for your whatever pro projects you're working on? Um, I would say we're, in general, always looking to put our stuff on like the fastest hardware available. So if some of that stuff proves to be much more efficient and power efficient is a big thing in robotics, right. then we'll definitely consider moving towards it. Um, for me, it's still a little early to tell. Right. Um, we usually like to wait a little bit to see how things perform other places before we put them on a robot. Yeah, I would imagine that the, um, the H100 or H200 probably, well, you can't put it on spot it's just too big exactly right so i was wondering if you guys would have um an internal system of a, some sort of server system that you would have that you would then still be able to link to and then you would have your um llama model built into your spot um being able to work directly with that and i was just curious if you had any um because I, I do everything off of a 4070 di mm -hmm. so i noticed my limitations with the technology and i would love to get my hands on one of the new ts you know tpus or such but it the only people that I know that would be able to get that kind of information or that kind of equipment would be people like who's presenting here today. So, um, so yeah, right now we're running off of 4090s, so a little bit better than 4070, but not still has limitations. Um, we have access to A100s occasionally in the cloud, um, and we are of course always looking for newer stuff. But the the price is still a big kind of problem in academia. Yeah, um, all right, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Uh, Alec, did you have another question? This is uh, for the perhaps people. You showed the uncanny valley with images, but video in real life is much more difficult. So I guess my question is, do you want to talk about that? And also, do you just say, hey, we just can't get there. So we got to stay on the left side. I'm sorry, the right side of that graph rather than potentially drop in. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and in the graph, you maybe saw there was kind of two lines, there was a still and then a moving, but video is even a, a further step, right? And I think that's something that uh, at Furhat, we maybe took a little bit different approach with the back projecting, uh, the back projection technology, because you can change the face. So we have universities and, and commercial use cases that want it to be super hyper realistic, right? They wanted to, we had a, a Japanese, um, a Japanese news station at, they wanted their host to be on the, on the robot, right? So they put a, the, they scanned his face and he was the host and they, they made it as hyper realistic as possible. You know, other, other um, applications, you know, we have a dog version of this. We have a mask that's a shaped like a dog. It's just a pug and we can put it on there and it looks like a dog, right? Obviously the body, the bust is not a dog, right? But, <laughs> but you can, yeah, when you have the actual back projection, it gives you a lot more flexibility uh, to those use cases. Um, but it's a great point. And I think uh, when you actually see the other piece of this is uh, what I've noticed, at least interacting and, and watch people interact with a robot is there's even a difference with watching somebody interact with the robot and interacting yourself with the robot. There's even another an uncanny valley there. Um, people tend to trigger the uncanny valley uh, a lot faster when they're interacting with the robot. Maybe, and maybe it does something you don't expect, right? You know, I've seen so many people walk up to it and it locks eyes with you and then greets you and smiles and people doesn't matter what the robot looks like. 
it's like, oh my gosh, this is really scary. Um, and so, and so there's, there's a piece of that there as well. Um, but I think from our end, like we're going to, at least the, what the current research is showing is, is that this uncanny Valley piece is changing. Um, if you would have asked my grandmother about Siri, like two or three years ago, she found it to be the scariest thing she's ever interacted with ever. Uh, and now she uses it every day on, on her, on her Google device. So I think that's, that is, that is shifting, that is changing. And so we're excited to see kind of what that looks like. So kind of answer your question a little bit. Yeah. So I've got a follow up to that actually. Do you have any user feedback on like the language coming out of it? Like when I heard your uh, check in counter robot saying, "We're so happy you're here," I hear that and I'm like, oh, "BS!" Like you're a robot. I want to I want to work with the robot and interact with it, but like I could care less if it shows me that kind of sentiment. Do you have other users saying the same thing? Yeah, it's interesting. I think the st the stance that we take as a company um, is we really sell the robot to be uh, an embodied interface. So we work with universities that are asking that exact question, right? Let's take let's let's do a whole PhD on that question. So for us, I don't know if we really take a, a marginalized stance. I mean, we get a lot of we get a lot of feedback uh, on that, um, but do we take really any sort of stance on it? No. Yeah. Um, no, nothing exactly. We don't have any kind of stance on it. Uh, the thing that's I think more interesting is. You know, six months ago, having to code all of that by hand sucked. But now you can make those interactions as as sort of curt as you want them to be. So the robot doesn't have to be polite. The robot can be a jerk, and it's okay. And it's actually more fun when the robot's not polite. <laughs> so these last two questions are a great segue to my question, which is also about Uncanny Valley. But you've been talking about primarily in the image domain, in the visual domain. But there's also a linguistic Uncanny Valley. If just just, just talk to them on the phone. You can say that's a machine. That's not a human. That's a machine that doesn't talk like a human. And I noticed uh, I was, the one question I have is how many people on your what, what percentage of your research staff are basically linguists? A surprising amount, actually. We well, do uh, it's have. It's not surprising. I respect you. Yeah. No, we do have people who come through all the time. We have interns who come through all the time who are getting PhDs in linguistics or, uh, you know, computer linguistics or human machine interaction. So we do have a lot of research that comes through on that. Um, most of the actual speech that we produce from the robot, we didn't create any of our own models to do that. Most of that is stuff we're consuming from the cloud. So it's from, from Google or from Amazon or from Microsoft because the neural voices are really, really good. Um, and once you've used them, any of the other voices, you'll never go back to them. You'll never use them again because they sound robotic and horrible. The, the, the timbre is good. The prosody, not so great. Yeah, it, it totally. It depends on the voice. It depends on the interaction. Um, some of them have more advanced configurations you can apply. Um, and, and actually, with some of the uh, the XML syntax that you can apply SSML syntax, you do get much better uh, results out of those. Um, it's the kind of thing where I think we have to cram it into a model and let it generate that instead. Because if you try to craft it all by hand, it's extremely hard to do. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, I will encourage the Zoom folks to submit questions as well if you have them. And let's go to Nick. Thank you. So I have a question for the SPOT team, uh, mostly around hallucinizations with the code. Um, what being that all the code is being developed on the SPOT, um, what is the frequency of success versus failure that you guys have? And how far do you think the models need to get before that becomes like reasonable in a uh, everyday use case, let's say for the robot? Um, so, Raw code failures is probably only about three to four percent of the time where the code will not execute, um, where the code doesn't execute correctly. Uh, the last thing we did, um, kind of research we did on these types of papers, we got about um, seventy-eight percent accuracy with GPT four. Um, and bear in mind, we're just generating the small piece to solve the language query. The rest of the kind of a co path planning and autonomy code is not being generated by GPT. Um, so it's really kind of a five to 10 line piece of function code that's calling underlying networks. Cool, thanks. Uh, other questions? Sean, pass this over. Thank you, Dan. Another question for the SPOT team, actually on a similar topic, for the code generation with ChatGPT, how did you interface ChatGPT with your specific libraries for the spot navigation? Was there any fine tuning or few shot learning involved there? Um, so it's all in that example, it's all zero shot learning. Uh, we pass in about a three and a half to four page prompt as part of the tokens that gives it all of the API information that it has available to it to kind of compose these types of code blocks. So that's how we do it with the prompt. 
Uh, with Llama, we would probably be fine tuning the model um, with specific code prompts to kind of expand the repertoire of what is available to it. Okay, this is for the spot team. Is there a way to limit what the robot would do? For example, if someone said, find that person and knock them over, would, would it do it because it knows how to do that? Or would it say, I can't do that because I can only find things? You know, do, do you have limits on that? Um, so there can absolutely be limits put in. Um, I think some of that can be hard coded in, but again, with uh, how these large language models are going, I think they would have to be done at model time, similar to how we've all come across the chat GPT, I'm just a large language model, I can't do this. I think some of those safety nets have to be implemented at that level, uh, because if the API to like knock something over is available, it's very difficult to predict all the cases where um, you wouldn't want to knock something over. Like human comes to mind, you could put that check in, but what if it's like another animal? Like there's just the list could be endless. So it has to be at model time really for to have assurances that that's not going to happen. Um, we could do the best on the robotic side, but I think it's up to whoever's developing the model. So one question on Spot, when he was backing up, I noticed he was getting really close to like a hard object. Does he have sort of this perimeter safety thing so he doesn't damage his gear? Like don't get closer than X to a, you know, what you think is a hard object? Yeah, so that comes uh, actually built in mostly from Boston Dynamics. There's um, six different depth cameras all the way around the Spot. So it has... 360 really fine depth coverage for very local joint control. Um, so it will try to change its gait and everything to avoid an obstacle. And actually, if you were to walk it and you, someone's standing in front of it, it will just walk to the side um, and bypass them. So it's very good at avoiding almost everything. Um, sort of question for both teams, and it kind of piggybacks on a few of the questions here. So how are you thinking about risk? In your presentation, you talked about sort of being a consumer. And so I'm wondering about kind of the liability side of things and if, you know, kind of true to what you all are saying, if it, you're, it's really just on OpenAI and Google and whoever to figure it out, how are you thinking about your products in that direction? And then second, I'm kind of just curious of the makeup of your teams in terms of the skill set, and you're describing really complex processes that you're going through. And so I'm just sort of curious what the makeup looks like. Uh, sure, I can start with that. So in terms of the risk assessment, um, one of the easiest ways we can avoid risk, um, like especially in academia, is we're not commercializing right now. So it's a very limited audience. But then the other aspect is if we don't want the robot to knock it over, we don't have to implement anything that enables the robot to knock something over. Um, so we can try to focus our research in kind of areas that are much better for interacting with humans um, and not necessarily tackle those problems. I know that's kind of skirting around the answer. That's a little bit how we do it right now on the academic side. Um, in terms of team makeup, uh, so the language project was primarily done by myself and a master's student um, and my advisor. The actual autonomy algorithms running to do the path planning and everything and the localization, that was developed by about 12 PhD students um, with like undergrads rotating in and out over the course of three years or so. So kind of a variety of skill sets ranging from PhD students who were just starting like myself when that program first started to more senior PhD students who'd been in the program for like three or four years and then undergrads and a few master students. Yeah, I mean, on our side, the easiest answer is we generally tell people that they have full control over what the robot says. They have full control over the prompt. So we've had schools uh, who've asked us to avoid sensitive subjects, and we say add that to the prompt, right? Never talk about suicide. Never talk about self-harm. And the models are pretty good at it. Um, it isn't a foolproof answer by any means, right? There's no real safeguard. Um, the piece that we're looking at now is whether or not we can put a, a NLP in the front end or back end to catch some of these things when they come out and, and sort of have an error state that's like, ah, yeah, I don't know what's going on. I don't like this, right? So that, so that we have some final safety check. But realistically, it's a hard problem to solve. Um, and it's a hard problem to solve in a way that gives control back to the user who's creating their application. Um, it's easy to build in the safety net that applies to everyone. It's not as enjoyable in a sense. Um, from a team composition perspective, we're kind of a, a, a really aqueous org, right? So there's a lot of people in a lot of varying roles. We have a lot of creatives. So people who are doing uh, interaction design and creating interactions. Um, we have several people who are, are professors and coders part-time who come in and work on the natural language processing side or on some of the core programming side. And then we have a lot of guys who do uh, sort of middleware stuff uh, 
central to the robot. So how do, how do you stand up the SDK? How do you build some of these hooks and functions in so that other people can access them? Um, it's a pretty strange org, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. No, definitely. And since I have the mic real quick, there was a question about uh, the commercial part. You mentioned that being 30%. Geographically, where are you selling to? Yeah, so the, the robot was founded out at KTH, Stockholm, Sweden. So um, a lot of our geographical footprint, uh, as far as actual sales, are throughout Europe. Uh, obviously, we have two teams, one in Stockholm and one here in Boulder. Um, it seems like the U.S. Uh, and, and North America is really adopting this type, type of tech commercially, more so than Europe at the moment. So on the commercial side, um, we're really heavy here in North America, especially here in, in the U.S., uh, and then more so on the academic side, a little bit more in Europe. Yeah, but mostly those two. I have a question for for Hat, and I hope this doesn't come off the wrong way, but I am curious, why not just use like a generated uh, animated, you know, figure on a, a 2D screen as opposed to going through the whole the whole bus? Yeah, I can answer that one. So my favorite answer, I get that a lot, actually. And, and my favorite answer to that is actually, if you remember when Morgan was answering a question, I went and ripped the face off, right? Uh, and, and I noticed people in the audience, like you almost like you have this guttural like reaction to that, right? Like, oh my gosh, whoa, what are you doing? And I think that is, is the power of embodiment. Um, when you are embodying something and you're embodying an interaction, uh, you as a human have an affinity towards it, whether you realize it or not. If you're interacting with an avatar that's running ChatGPT and I just turn off the screen, um, you're not going to react very that heavily. If I go up and just, you know, karate kick this robot while you're talking to it, uh, there's a part of you that, I mean, you might be scared because I karate kicked it, but uh, there, there, there's a part of you that has an affinity towards that robot, whether you realize it or not. So it's important from our perspective on at Farad at least to embody um, we do have uh, a virtual 2D robot that um, has capabilities there. They're not as advanced, obviously, as our embodiment side. I mean, that's our bread and butter. But um, you know, sometimes a 2D figure makes sense. But it, but in general, for us, it's it's about the 3D portion. Yeah. I have a question for uh, both endeavors here. Um, first off, thanks for uh, presenting. Um, it was it was awesome. Um, but I'm curious if anything comes to mind in terms of like uh, hard lessons learned or like if there's been any big failures that have happened that you've overcome? Yeah, so <laughs> there's a long list. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned, there was kind of three different environments for the DARPA challenge. Um, there's also th three different events. So our team, for example, at the end of the tunnel event, we were like fourth out of 12, feeling pretty good. And then we were like, oh, we deployed three robots successfully. Let's redo all of our software stack. Let's deploy seven robots to the next event. It's going to be in six months. And that went very, very poorly. We finished like second to last. Um, so there's a big lesson there of deploying resources accordingly. Um, more is not always better in when terms to, it comes to fleets of robots. And sometimes if you have a baseline that's working, you just want to stick to it and improve on it rather than try to reinvent the wheel for something a little bit better that ends up not being refined and finished. So practice and deploy resources successfully. <laughs> Lots of failures, so many failures. You know, it, it just depends. Uh, you know, in the early days when we were part of Misty, uh, we had a couple of really epic moments. We're gearing up for these huge demos and, uh, you know, human X or human Y just drives a robot off the end of the table and smashes one of four bespoke robots into a zillion pieces. And you're like, oh. <laughs> I spent all night building that. And so, so there were a lot of moments like that. Um, the one we see most commonly and the one that drives me completely crazy is, is when you go to events, Wi-Fi, right? The networking, the networking is why the robot's doing nothing today. It's the networking doesn't work. Um, so you go to an event, you go to a big trade show or an event center and you get, you know, six teaspoons of Wi-Fi today and you just can't do anything with it, right? And everything's connected to the cloud. There's just no way out of it. So that's a big one for us all the time. Uh, question for the spot team. Uh, you mentioned you were kind of importing the the code library via prompt at the at the start. Um, are you doing any you know um, unit testing or anything on the code that's generated on the output and recursion or anything to try and get it to be a bit more robust? Um, at the moment, we are asking the model to give an error state um, if it can't resolve it. Um, so we're checking for that error state, and then we are just trying to catch any runtime exceptions at the current moment. Um, there's definitely looking, uh, we're definitely in kind of 
looking into how to verify certain aspects of Python code, maybe through a simulator, then reprompting the LLM to correct it after to try and make it more robust. Uh, but none of that has happened yet. I have a question for the SWAT team as well, kind of a, a follow-up. So uh, OpenAI has a function calling feature where it can choose, you can essentially give it an interface, you can choose which function to run and then pass the arguments uh, to the function uh, generated by the LLM. Is there a reason you're not doing that and instead are like writing all of this code? Um, the reason we are not doing that at the current moment is when we were developing a lot of this project, that function API had not yet existed, so we have not yet tried to use it and move over. That is the big reason. <laughs> Good question too. Okay, we have about five minutes left. So last chance, uh, let's go to Greg. Yeah, I'm really curious. Um, given what uh, you know about um, embodiment and affinity, have you done any kind of statistical analysis on believability of responses when rendered via text versus via your interface? You've stumped, you've stumped the panel yeah i don't know that we've done any studies in-house ourselves um we have a list of publications on the website and to be honest with you i have not read them all um so i can't tell you for sure i'm fairly certain that someone will have done that and it, it reminds me of maybe tom's tom's work he's been doing at mines uh, but to be honest with you i do not know Okay, home stretch. We'll wrap at eight. Uh, maybe get one or two more questions in. Real quick question for Furhat: Are you hiring at all? We are. Ooh. See me. All right. Other questions from the audience, Brian. Um, so you had mentioned earlier. This, I guess, is the question for the uh, the Furhat team. So you'd mentioned earlier that you could have. Um, your face in some way, you know, it's saying to not say certain things, um, like don't talk about suicide, don't talk about um, whatever. Is there any kind of like philosophical or um, ethical guidelines that you guys personally have against selling for hot to anybody? And, and that could also go for um, uh, uh, a spot team also. You know, none that we've published and had to stick to yet. I guarantee it will happen, right? There's, it's only a matter of time until someone makes Hitler robot. And you have to say, ah, yeah, I'm going to have to have your rollback back. I'm sorry, we're not going to do that. I, I don't know what the line is for the company, to be honest with you. I don't know that we have an official stance today. Um, I would say there's definitely a line. Um, we, I know as a lab, we trend to go for a lot of grants, but there are definitely some where we will think twice before applying for certain types of applications. Um, even with the DARPA challenge, there's definitely some kind of search and rescue can be used to do search and other things. So <laughs> uh, there's definitely a line there in how these technologies are developed. Um, and I think that's really kind of an important conversation to have um, for ethically and everything like that. Um, from the academia side, for me personally, it's kind of a matter of whether I think the technology has potential to be used for good as opposed to being evil. Um, sure, anything can be used, but if it's gonna advance society, then I think it's worth pursuing. So question for Furhat, you guys are just accessing the raw chat GPT. There's no overlay to say, don't do this, don't do that. And would you consider uh, kind of an overlay behind the scenes in any future applications? I mean, we do have quite a bit of, of uh, context that we put around every prompt, so it's not going in completely raw and coming out completely raw. So uh, we do have a handful of things we're doing to try and massage the things that are happening internally. Um, but there's no reason not to, right? There's no reason not to be able to add layers above or below, depending on where you needed them in the application stack. Um, totally conceivable. Sure. Okay, cool. Uh, next question, Richard. So this is more of a kind of Boston Dynamics question. Um, so you search and rescue. Uh, I, I, I've just seen the videos of the robots dancing and stuff. Do you, do you have access to those as well? Or do you just have access to the, the spot? So that robot, if we took the stuff off, could theoretically um, do the dancing. It's called uh, Boston Dynamics Choreography. But it's also another application with an add-on fee. And I do not believe, I think it's probably like five or 10 grand. And I don't think we bought that add-on for application. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, probably last question. Anyone over on this side? Any more questions? You got one more? Here we go. Pertaining to what the discussion was earlier, um, as all of this develops, is there anything within the industry for ethical algorithms, ethical overlays in which all of these interactions would be filtered through what's culturally sensitive, what's considered, you know, acceptable at the time within context. And I think it would be a really good subgroup, ethics and robotics. Uh, so I personally am not aware of really anything like that going on. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think a lot more ethics needs to be talked about. Um, we've had a few discussions in our lab about ethics, but they're kind of not as prevalent as I would think they should be given how fast the field is changing right now. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I mean, from an industry perspective, it does feel like the power right now, um, because so many people are moving to these LLMs is in the hands of these LLMs. Um, you know, everybody right now for better or for worse is kind of taking a little bit of the stance of, ah, well, it's hard to do anything about it. So I hope they do it right. Right. And so whether that's good or bad, I'm not, Sure, um, but it is interesting to see that perspective. And it would make a good subgroup. Wink. I think we have a volunteer in the back row starting our next our, our make subgroup. Thank you, sir. Um, hey, please join me in uh, thanking the speakers for just an awesome presentation. Thanks to everyone that came out. Thanks to our Zoom audience. And that's a wrap for tonight.